All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome to this week in Missouri politics on a very kind of somber, melancholy week here in Missouri. Uh, State Auditor Tom Schweik was laid to rest this week on Tuesday in Clayton. So this week we decided not to bring you an elected official or um, or any other thing that might be in the news because there really was not wasn't that much news this week. What we decided to do is after the eulogy from Senator Danforth about a new type of politics and changing the tone, we decided to bring you three of the people that decide what the politics are. Three of the people at the top of their game and. Three of the folks that, when you see a campaign, these are the folks that bring it to you and why it's the way it is. Uh, starting with David Barklage, the uh, principal with uh, Barklage and Nodell, uh, one office here in Clayton, Jeff City in Springfield, right? Yes, sir. Michael Sean Kelly, MSK, the principal of the Kelly Group, KMOX, Fame, Fox 2, so on and so forth. And then uh, Travis Brown. I run out of ways to introduce you, author, entrepreneur, head of Pelopidus, so on and so forth. And Travis, we'll start with you. You were at the funeral this week. You heard the eulogy. What was your take? Well, it's, you know, there's no way to get over the tragic loss. And the record as state auditor was amazing. So I just feel most importantly for the family and hope that everyone can, can come together after this. Um, it just, it's, it's such a loss for the family. No one expected this to happen. And of course, um, the calls for civility, I think, are are you know a good tone but it's it's also important for all, all of us to just take a deep breath and and first honor the family true david barklage um i know that you had a interesting facebook post kind of corresponding out of the funeral tell us a little about that well you know i think the thing is is that there is any time a tragedy like this happens people try to focus in a fixed blame and i think that's the wrong thing there's nothing productive that really comes from that and and part of Senator Danforth's message was a message about you know trying to change the tone of politics and civility and I do think that um, we've gotten in an age where uh, Twitter and Facebook and other instant medias make it very easy to say things that you can't take back uh, and they're things electronically you know one thing is if if Mike Kelly calls me a name while we're drinking a beer it don't really think about it. once you put it on Twitter and everybody sees it and I think in some respects it becomes more personal and I've seen a trend in recruiting uh, that the civility politics has gotten because of again electronic records and everything else and people don't want if they want to go to an employer later on or their family seen it again you could probably keep from your family some of the political discourse but as a result of I think uh, communication trends and, and, and just sort of where things are going that the civility politics has left. We're losing good people to run and I think that in itself is a problem. When you can't get good people to run, we get bad results. Mike Kelly, the Democrat reaction to this, what are you hearing? Well, uh, look, I think everybody in the state of Missouri is still reeling from what we experienced a little over a week ago. Um, I don't think any of us saw that, that this potentially would have been coming. Uh, obviously, we had a governor's race that was building up. Uh, they tend to uh, get uh, heated um, and, and grow in their rhetoric. And uh, then you have a tragic event like we've experienced this week. And I think it provides a, uh, a good opportunity for everybody to take a step, step back, uh, a deep breath, and reassess where we're headed as a body politic. And uh, to, to go to the premise of the question, I'm not sure that we're facing a Democrat or Republican issue. Sure. I think this is the human experience that we're dealing with, and 
we, we had some negative campaigning that was taking place. I'm not sure it's much different than what we typically experience in any other campaign. Um, uh, we had some, uh, clearly some mental health issues that, that have, have probably uh, started to manifest and that we will hopefully get a chance to examine as well. And I think all of us in Missouri would just like to be able to take a deep breath and really understand why and what happened here. You know, David, there's one thing that I, you know, being at the funeral, there was a eulogy. I might have liked to hear a little bit more about Tom Schweik's life. I mean, he was probably the most accomplished person to ever serve at the executive branch. There, was a, there wasn't a lot about his life in this. I think maybe we're, we're getting into these accusations and stuff and we're not really celebrating the guy's life maybe as, as he deserved. Well, look, you know, Tom took a lot of, of uh, positions that required him to be away from home, away from his family. Uh, he was in narco-terrorism, which put his family and himself at risk. I mean, he went up against the drug lords in, in Afghanistan. You look at him, you're like, this guy did that? Uh, and he did. He took him on. He was fearless. Uh, you know, during the Waco investigation, that was a very uh, uh, sensitive national issue. So he took up again and again those kinds of things. He served three uh, ambassadors to the, to the UN. Uh, he was an ambassador himself. Uh, you know, he had an amazing life. He was incredibly smart. Uh, and, you know, I think he was probably one of the best auditors ever. I, I got lucky. Uh, Senator Danforth had asked myself and Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder to sit down with him when he was trying to make a decision of whether he should run for the U.S. Senate or run for something else. And he's, you know, was an accomplished author about uh, books on finance. He had a perfect resume for auditor. And one of the things that, a few things that I do very well is sort of profile candidates. He was the perfect candidate for that. And he was the perfect auditor. So, you know, w the, the morning of, of losing a guy who gave up a tremendous amount of income to serve again and again, taken away from his family is something that we shouldn't walk away and forget. Travis, you're involved in campaigns, kind of moved to the, some of the issues that did surround his passing. You're involved in political races all over the country. You travel the nation. Was anything that happened in this race that different than other stuff? I mean, you know, the people talk about this whisper campaign as though it's true, maybe it was. But is there, a, is there, was there something so radically different in Missouri that was going on that's not happening in other places? Politics always has been and always will be a contact sport. I agree with David that the nature of contact has changed, that there's room for everybody to improve upon uh, how they do that. Um, I think everyone, what I heard from other states, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. when I first got the news last week, was just complete you know, stun and, and awe that, that anything or any condition of the human experience would, would take it. Uh, anywhere else. Uh, the state auditor's role, I, I agree with you, I think the legacy of his record needs to stand and stand tall because um, while there were issues with which we might have disagreed uh, in terms of his future, uh, his record as state auditor was unparalleled. And all the things that uh, someone like Tom uh, fought for and sacrificed for were uh, important things on the conservative record here in Missouri. He was uh, putting a greater accountability in our school districts, uh, taking tough stances against our tax credit programs uh, that needed more evaluation. He was doing exactly the things that he sought out to do. So we all need to recognize, I think, and learn from that we're all free to fight for and run for whatever we decide to run for, but we also know how hard it is to stay the course, how much conflict arises in a situation like this. You know, Mike, um, some of the criticism that's starting now is some of the editorial pages are making Tom Schweik out to be this, you know, saintly, martyred person, and you should accomplish things the editorial page has been advocating for for a few years in honor of him. Is the media maybe trying to co-opt a tragedy a little disingenuously? Well, I can't really speak to uh, what the editorial pages are, are doing. I think that all of us are trying to find, one, an answer to what caused this, and two, maybe some positive solutions that can come out of it. Um, from my perspective, uh, you know, I, next to Mr. Gephardt, the person I have the most respect for in political life is Senator Danforth. Um, what he's done for Missouri politic, I think, is second to none. Um, and I was hopeful that kind of, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that he put a spotlight on negative campaigning and the conversation that needs to take place. 
I wish that we could have also have spoken more about where we head as a society in helping people dealing with, with certain issues that take place out there. And I think that's collectively what's going on is that we're looking to place blame or a fix to the cause of the problem rather than dealing with the global issues that really need to be discussed. Well, two of the issues that kind of came out of the eulogy and some of the news has been, one, there was um, an enclosed whisper campaign. Two, there was a, a negative radio spot. Uh, Travis, you supported a candidate, Catherine Hannaway, in the race before Tom ever got in. That's right. Um, very well documented. Your very generous support of her. Uh, a lot of folks, some in the media, would would literally, you know, run through ten brick walls to criticize you <laughs> and your organization. They right. tried to insinuate that maybe you paid for the ad. Is that true? It's not true. We neither directly or indirectly uh, support or condone or sponsored in any way that radio ad that was uh, suspect. But look, it's, uh, there, there's a lot here to learn from. Uh, if we're going to apply civility, we need to apply civility across both parties with donors as well. Those that are uh, critical of the uh, C4 activities and the anonym, anonymous nature of campaigns today that have become a dominant part of what the United States Supreme Court has affirmed need to understand that if they want uh, donor civility across the board, they need to lead by example as well. So uh, we've been among the most transparent uh, you know, donor networks in the last five years. There's probably no one more than Rex Sinkfield that is led by that example uh, and taking a lot of arrows for it. But we. You know, we supported uh, State Auditor Tom Schweik early in his campaign for State Auditor, um, and it's just sad to see the, this turn of events. Uh, David Barklage, is there a top consultant in the state or in, in the Midwest that hasn't ran one of these ads that was probably meant to get attention in the media, put a little bit of money behind? Is, the, is, is there anyone that hasn't ran an ad similar to the one that was ran uh, a couple weeks ago? You know, I Every one of us, and on my posting, I gave an apology for anything in the 400 plus campaigns that I've done that, that someone would take personal offense to. It is easy. The emotion in a campaign is great. Um, it's not just a dispassionate consultant putting something together. There's sort of a paternalistic um, uh, emotional response sometimes when someone you care about is attacked. You want to strike back. The problem is, is that TV is a very forceful and very visible way to do that. Um, you know, I, I again, we can dive into the issues of, of uh, you know, who's to blame and everything else. I just think the most productive thing is to challenge ourselves. Uh, and I do think it's inner party. I think Mike would agree with this, that Republicans, if they would just focus on trying to get Republicans to do right, and Democrats would do the same, we would have a better deal. For me to go out and tell Democrats, you're doing everything wrong, isn't going to go anywhere. And so I do think it's sort of an internal party thing that has to start out. Speaking of internal party politics, one person that has been mentioned and, and caught some, a lot of criticism is John Hancock. Um, Mike, you spoke up for John, your partner on Camo X. Um, what is your take and, and how is well, John? I would, I would say a couple things, you know, first, uh, I've known John for about 20 years of my life now. Uh, first as an adversary, um, uh, when we played politics as the executive directors, uh, second as a co-worker, um, whether it be at KMOX or Fox 2, and third, uh, most importantly, as a friend. Um, and what happens when you have two people from such diverse uh, positions who yeah. become friends, you, 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 uh, the way that happens is you accu accumulate a mutual respect for each other. Um, and through that process, I mean, I've gotten to know John, and he's one of my better friends. I mean, I can tell you two things. One, John's not an anti-Semite. Two, he's not a bigot. Um, what John is is a good person and a good man. Um, this isn't political, um, That what we're facing right now. This is human. Um, when you have someone who takes the act of suicide, which truly is the most irrational act that any of us can, can even fathom, and try to come to a rational outcome, therefore, of it, I think is simplistic. Um, it's dangerous and it's harmful. It's harmful to the family. It's harmful to the friends of Auditor Schweik. It's harmful to John Hancock and his family. And really, I think what we all need to do is take a, a, a giant step back and look at this. And so John, I think, uh, sits with a clear conscience today, knowing that he um, did nothing wrong, um, but clearly is, is 
likely has to be moved and, 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 and hurt from what we're all reeling from and wanting to understand an explanation. Then on the top of it all, you get a bullseye put on your back by uh, Senator Danforth. I just don't think it's fair. Um, I think it's harmful, and I'm not sure what purpose it's serving. David, we talk about whisper campaigns. I've not seen anybody step forward on the record and say, John Hancock said this anti-Semitic comment to me about Tom Schweik this day. Do you think we're kind of doing a whisper campaign since we don't have anybody that stepped forward and said, this is what he did? Well, that's an awkward question because um, I ran uh, Tom Schweik's campaign in 2010. There were these same accusations then. But candidly, our view of it was, so what? It's part of politics. It happens to all of us. We've all been either the butt of it or, or been in the middle of these things. So we moved on at that point. And so, you know, I, again, I think we're trying to focus in, you know, is John Hancock guilty or not or someone else guilty or not? And I think we're missing the point that the parties need to seriously look at how we can approach our candidates and put real penalties in place so that they will not go down these personal roads. It's just not necessary, and you really don't win races with them. To me, it's sort of rookie move. If you think you can win a race by calling worse names about your opponent than they call about you, you don't. And then once you get elected, you got to govern. And if you have to govern after you've done that, it's that much harder for everybody, and it's that much harder to work together after those Travis, things. Travis, I'm somebody that, that knows John Hancock. He's a friend of mine. I do believe him to be a good person. Is You're one of the most influential conservatives in the state. Is there two different issues between defending John Hancock as a person and whether he should stay as head of the party? Yeah, I think the matter of leadership of the party is up to the party committee and what they decide. Look, he, he's in a weird place right sure. here. Uh, he just got elected. Uh, it was a pretty sound election from what I could tell in Kansas City. Uh, and then this unusual uh, event happens. I think the committee needs to decide that uh, and, and figure out what's best. And, and, you know, I'm certain that he talked to the committee as to why he wanted to run. I don't know why anybody won't be a party chairman. It's a tough, thankless job. Uh, so I agree with Mike that we all need to take a little breather here and let things settle, uh, honor uh, the respect of the trauma of, that everyone is going through. And... Uh, just give it some time. Well, and uh, with that, we'll be right back to talk about 2016 and some else with our uh, very esteemed panel here. And we'll see you in a moment. Across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. And we're back. It's, as you could tell, this segment's going to be much lighter. It's already a good time here. Uh, we're going to talk 2016. You brought, uh, Travis, you brought Sam Brown back to Jeff City to talk to the Republican caucus. He cut taxes. Some would have you believe it's wrecked Kansas. Others believe that people like their own money. What was the message and how was it received? Well, Kansans last November re-elected Governor Sam Brown back after he zeroed out self-employment taxes. That is, the LLCs and LLPs of, that are so important to the metro Kansas City area. We now know that small business formation is uh, fourth best in the country, uh, certainly leading the region. We see small business formation. He came to talk about wage growth, which is about three points higher and on the Johnson County, Kansas side. We think that's an important conversation. Uh, take it or leave it with tax cutting policies that are taking place here in Missouri and really part of a national story. A lot of chief executives of states are trying to lower the price of work uh, so that we see more work. Mike Kelly, what's the case for giving the government more of your money? 
Well, uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, I think the reality on, is, is that, um, that I've been there is watching a... him twisted. He's been so good up to this point. I know, he, and, he and then boom, then boom. I was watching him well, on yours, yeah. and he was. Let sitting me steal there. a line from Rex Singfeld, and that is that. Proceed. Next to Missouri, now we have a live experience experiment of the plan that 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 Rex would like to ultimately see put into place. Um, to this point, it hasn't really panned out that well in Kansas, but time may change that. And I really think that Missouri has a unique opportunity to sit in the stands, watch what happens in Kansas. The reality of what we have in Missouri is, is we're going to have to grow population. We've got to find ways to bring, bring jobs and grow population in the state of Missouri. And I think all topics have to be on the table. And here we go. We've got an experiment right now in Kansas, City, Kansas that we can watch and judge whether or not that's the right direction for Missouri to go. David, politically, does this matter? Does what Kansas does really matter to voters? Well, I think so, but I think if Mike wants to grow population, it needs to start at home. So, uh, <laughs> uh, can, the, can, can the state handle that? Is that really the type of population we're trying to recruit here in Missouri? <laughs> it's the only chance we Democrats have is if we start multiplying. You guys have taken over. <laughs> uh, the, you know, I, I absolutely. Uh, I think that <clears throat> when you know that 67 percent of our population is along the borders. Uh, other states' policies affect us tremendously, and I think that you have to look at what Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, other states are doing uh, and how that's going to uh, impact our growth, and, and across those state lines are important. I think we have certain advantages in regards to competition with Illinois, and I think we have certain disadvantages on other borders in, in Arkansas, like you know, right to work and other issues like that. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. Yeah, that's, just drop that. It's very David Barth. Just drop the bomb and walk off. I thought um, it was fairly <laughs> subtle. Very subtle too. It, it was, it was smooth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, David, while we're talking to you, 2016, um, this the, the the situation with the auditor obviously will affect Catherine Hanway in some way. How does that affect her? And will we see more people in the race now? I, I think so. I think um, Catherine Hanaway, uh is known as being one of the toughest, uh, I mean, hardest workers in politics. Uh, and I think that uh, from an ethical standpoint, people saw her as a House Speaker that, that was very ethical and driven. Uh, but those haven't, for whatever reason, translated into excitement on a campaign. I don't know if it's the state of the party or the state of her candidacy. But as a result, I think you will see other people uh, looking to get in. You have Eric Greitens, who is a former Navy SEAL, a Rhodes Scholar, graduated doctors in, in Oxford who looks like a strong candidate. There's been discussion about Blaine Luchtemeyer, uh, the congressman uh, from Northern Missouri, looking at this again, or central Northern Missouri. Uh, John Bruner, who ran unsuccessfully for the Senate, been very successful business manager, uh, fits a great profile, very kind, has a lot of evangelical and I think Tea Party support. Um, there's been even rumors recently uh, about uh, Jim Talent or Vicki Hartzler, uh, even Eric Schmidt or, or Kurt Schaefer, guys who are already raised money and, and in it. So I think on the Republican side, you're going to see some soul searching. And, you know, it's a, it's a pause between giving time to sort of let everybody think through what's just happened, uh, proper respect to the family and to the auditor, and then uh, making decisions moving forward, and I think we'll start to see those some of those decisions in the next few weeks. Travis, you support, decided to support Catherine Hanway early and in a big way. What was what, what was your decision making process when you decided to pick her? I, I assume you figured it was likely she would have a primary, but you chose to support Catherine Hanway. What was the what went through your mind as you made that decision? Well, you're exactly right. Heavy support of Catherine Hanway took place before anyone else announcing or even thinking about that, and that doesn't change in this environment. We like Catherine Hanway's record. Uh, we like what she stands for. We like uh, how she's governed and, and proven that how hard she'll work. You know, the point: any, any candidate has the right to run, and any sure. donor has a right to support who they believe in. And so, I think what's great about the race in 2016 is going to be a battle for ideas and there's going to have to be some strong arguments that are won no matter who uh, earns that and that's the same thing true for our presidential uh, primary hopefuls right now no one's going to get coronated there's going to have to be a true earning process that goes through everyone has to prove that they can ignite inspire and and build coalitions that are going to build voters 
Mike Kelly, is there a, a candidate the Democrats kind of fear a little bit or would rather see than another one? Well, you're a year and a half out from an election, and I think the abundance of candidates on the Republican side and the lack of discipline probably in trying to avoid primaries is probably the best thing the Democrats have going for them. Uh, that's not unique to just Missouri. It's happening nationally. We're watching all these candidates run uh, for president on the Republican side, and there seems to be only a couple that are being talked about on the Democratic side. I really think that focused opportunity for Democrats to avoid primaries, save their money, be out talking to candidates or talking to the voters about real issues rather than uh, going after each other is going to give Democrats a distinct advantage in 2016, and it's going to be a good year. So whoever runs, you feel Coster well, can be whoever. Chris Coster is clearly the most qualified candidate in the governor's race to be governor. Um, he's out raising the money uh, that is necessary. He's out communicating to voters and talking about the direction that he'd like to see the state going. And Republicans, unfortunately, are have, for them, are having to raise money and talk about each other. I think that uh, Democrats are in a good place, and Chris Coster is going to be the next governor of the state of Missouri. At least Mike waited until the end. There you go. <laughs> uh, last topic, uh, David Barklage. Is it, will we actually, a year and a half from now, see a difference in the tone of campaigns? I have hope that we will. Uh, candidly, I think the parties can take a very strong role. I think the parties can require candidates to sign a contract, that the state committees can react, that they can get donors to react, that they can condemn inappropriate behavior. And candidly, I think the voters, the reason we're upside down, we just got polling back uh, and we have such a, a wrong track. In other words, most people believe the state is going in the wrong direction, as do they believe in the country. It's not just the subs of politics, it is the tone. I don't think people feel good about their government or their elected officials when they're spending all their time talking about what other people are doing wrong. And that's whether it's about President Obama or the Congress. I think people want to hear an engagement of the issues. And it's not that political commercials that are negative don't work. It's just a fact that I think that we can take leadership and changing the tone and content and the focus of campaigns. I think we have to. Trev, is a year and a half from now, do you predict there'll actually be a difference in the tone of the campaigns? There could be, but uh, we know negative campaigning is, an, is a part of the total picture. That's not the way you win. Uh, there's got to be more than just a negative campaign. So, again, I think every statewide office holder is going to have to win the argument. They're going to have to explain exactly what they're for. Uh, the personal hostilities can be parked to the sideline for the most part, but there's always going to be uh, critics and opponents. Uh, one person's terrorist group is another person's yeah. freedom fighting organization. Right. And so, and we have to be in a democracy, in the republic we, we serve, we have to recognize that that's always been there uh, since the days of Washington and Jefferson. Exactly. Uh, politics has always been prone to taking some extreme views and the tactics and the operations are always it, been critical. It doesn't always bring out the best in us either, right? Politics is a substitution for violence. But the alternative is, is that we, we go shoot each other and decide who's going to win. It's always been a bit hostile. I get that we want to place some focus on some particular issues that are happening right this minute. It's an important conversation for us to have, but it's not a new conversation. But Mike, we have been engaged in campaigns against each other for years. And you are as passionate as anybody I know. You care about it truly. You're emotional about it. Right. One of the things I love about you. But we're friends and we've made it work. And I think that we're naive to think that we can't make that demand of the politic and make it work as well. And that's where we'll better. have to leave it for this week. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on This Week in Missouri Politics. And we'll see you right here again next Sunday morning.